Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Last week, I was talking about the polar vortex that was going across the U.S., and today it's 68 degrees, and I have my window open. This weather is so strange, uh, but I won't bore you with my weather obsession. I love talking about the weather. I know people find it like irritating and annoying, so I'll stop talking about it, but I do love some weather conversation. Another thing I'm nerdy about is, of course, wellness. And if you're a wellness nerd like me, then you're probably familiar with the Gallup organization and in particular with the book, Wellbeing, the Five Essential Elements. If you haven't read it, I really encourage you to do so. It exposed me to the research behind how the different dimensions of well-being are so interconnected. They're all interconnected. And luckily, as I've started meeting wellness professionals over the years, especially those challenging the status quo, some of you use the Gallup 5 as the framework for your organization's approach to well-being. Now, one area within the five dimensions is that I'm that I'm extremely interested in is career well-being because according to Gallup, people with high career well-being are more than twice as likely to be thriving in their lives overall. And also since this aspect of well-being often relies on partnerships with others in your organization or different conversations with your clients, it's usually seen a little bit as outside of our scope as wellness professionals. So I wanted to learn more and really more particularly, like how, what can we do about it? Right? So when I was at the Fusion 2.0 conference, I had the pleasure of hanging out with Ryan Wolf, who is a physical well-being lead at Gallup. So I met him last year at Wellcoa and then ran back into him at Fusion 2.0. And he's a great guy. Hi, Ryan, if you're listening. And I asked him if anyone from Gallup would come on the podcast to talk about career well-being. And I was so fortunate that Ryan connected me with Jim Harder, today's guest. Jim is chief scientist for Gallup's workplace management practice. He's also the co-author of a few books, the one I mentioned earlier, Well-Being, the Five Essential Elements. He's also co-author of 12, The Elements of Great Managing. And then his research is featured in First, Break All the Rules. Now, Dr. Jim Harder's work has appeared in many publications, including Harvard Business Review, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, and Time Magazine, and of course, in academic articles and book chapters. And so for some of you that love Strengths Finders, Michelle Spear, a shout out to you. I like doing these shout outs. They're kind of fun. Let me tell you Jim's five strengths. Achiever, focus, learner relator, and futuristic. Now, today, Jim and I discuss the research behind the five elements of of well-being, and he answers my burning question. Where does emotional health fall into these five elements? We then really dig into the career well-being, what it is, again, more research behind it, and why they are moving more towards the term purpose well-being instead of career well-being. We discuss why so many people seem to live for the weekends, the link between poor career well-being and health, and then what we can do about it as wellness professionals and then what our organizations can do about it. We talk a lot about managers, but before I dive into this interview with Jim, I want to invite you to the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. It's a group of super supportive people who are trying to challenge the status quo of wellness. You know, anytime someone asks a question, there are always people responding like, it's just a great group. And I've started doing weekly Facebook lives where each Thursday, I haven't nailed down a time yet, but every Thursday I hop on Facebook live and I break down the week's podcast in about five minutes. So hopefully you're obviously listening to the full interview, but what I like to do is say, here's really what I got from it. And here are my takeaways. And here's what I encourage you to do with it. So if you want to join us, you can just go to Facebook, type in redesigning wellness community, and our group should come up. All you have to do is answer a couple questions and ta-da, you're in. So please come join us. All right, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did with Dr. Jim Harder. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. 
Well, Jim, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you on today. Thanks, Jen. Great to be with you. Now, for those people who have not read The Five Elements of Well-Being, can you just start by telling us about the extensive research that went into defining these five areas of well-being? Sure. So a bunch of us at Gallup uh, reviewed really the last 50 years of research prior to when we uh, published this work is in 2010. But prior to that time, we reviewed about 50 years of research that we'd done not only at Gallup, but also that had been done in academia to really start honing in on a central question, which was, are there some generalizable characteristics of well-being that individuals can leverage and do something about to improve their lives? And so that was a question, really, is are there, is it different everywhere or are there some generalizable characteristics? And we found that there were some that just led to thriving lives all over the world. We had a chance to study people in 150 countries asked hundreds of questions, did a bunch of uh, statistically what we call factor analysis to understand, are there some uh, question groupings that really define those general characteristics I was referring to? And um, one one of the places we looked uh, was our our founder, George Gallup, had done a lot of work in studying people. He's known for, for, for being a pollster, and so that's how a lot of people think about his career. But he was really a keen observer of people and uh, what caused you know good lives how do you le- how do you lead a good life and one of his studies we came across was called the secrets of a long life where he studied people to live who lived to be 95 years of age and older and was really looking for some of the common traits there and some of them are kind of timeless findings that make a lot of sense to us today these people ate smaller meals they moved around a lot in their in their work uh, but the other thing is related to your topic here today and that's that they they said they really enjoyed their jobs. They got a great deal of satisfaction from their work. And most of them worked into their 80s. So they just kept working. Their their career was kind of their life and they enjoyed it. And so that's, uh, I think, uh, career well-being is a real foundational element. There are five we found, um, career well-being or what we call purpose well-being now, social well-being, financial well-being, physical well-being, and community well-being were the five that generalized across different parts of the world in predicting, you know, whether people say they have a thriving life and also how they experience their days and health outcomes. We looked at a number of different types of um, well-being outcomes. Yeah, 150 countries. That's pretty impressive right there. And and you guys were, you know, 10 years ago talking about financial well-being, and now it's finally kind of gotten into a little bit more of the mainstream. Now, the one I've always wondered about is how does emotional well-being fit into the model? Yeah, that's a good question. Emotional well-being is really one of the outcomes we looked at. And so all five elements of well-being predict two general categories of well-being outcomes. So um, we all, as we go through our days, we all kind of have two selves. We've got an evaluating self that that sits back periodically and evaluates where we're at in life. And we've got a self that goes through our days and experiences a lot of emotions from smiling and laughter to enjoyment to how well rested we feel to the interest we have and the negative emotions as well are you know sadness anger pain stress worry and so um, we really looked for characteristics or elements of well-being that predicted both how people evaluate their lives overall and how they experience their days and so that emotional well-being component was an outcome of all five and uh a real central one to both the you know the evaluating self and the experiencing self was uh, career or purpose well-being. So uh, does that answer your question? So it, I would think of emotional well-being as an outcome of the five elements. Yes, yes, it does. And I'm guessing that if you want to tackle like emotional health as an organization, then you would actually look to each of the different five elements of, of well-being. That's right. Uh, I, I would I would argue emotional well-being is very difficult to solve on its own. You really need to get into some of the nitty-gritty um, elements in our lives to, to, to get at that. And the other thing we found in this work is that the people at the highest levels of well-being were really working simultaneously on multiple elements. They weren't, it isn't like they just focused in on one. So if you think about wellness, for instance, these people with high levels of overall well-being weren't just focused on their physical health, they got their physical health done by maximizing many of the other elements because they support, um, they provide the supportive mechanisms that allow them to get their their health right. 
it's very difficult. We've all had experiences like this to, to maximize our health on a continuous basis. We can do it in the short term, but it's hard to, to maintain it if we don't have our uh, work aligned with it, if we don't have our social life aligned with it, if our finances don't support it, and if we don't have a community that uh, provides us opportunities to uh, exercise or eat the right kinds of things through positive defaults, it, it, it gets to be very difficult over time. Got it. So emotional on, on its own, you're not going to go say, I'm going to go solve my emotional well-being by itself, but rather you're going right. to look at everything else that's connected to it. That's right. And yeah, think about these, the five as, as they're really kind of the basics to getting that emotional uh, well-being right, both in terms of reducing the negatives and uh, increasing the positives. Yeah. Thank you for that explanation. It's always been on my mind. I've always wondered. It's like, it just feels like there should be an emotional uh, well-being uh, bucket, if you will. But that well, I think you're not alone because I see people just throw that extra category in there. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I it's, may have done that, Jim. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's okay, but I would just, from a, a causal perspective, I would think about that as an outcome of the five. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Mm-hmm. No, you know, we're here to talk about career well-being, although we could probably dive into each one. I'll spare you that today. And, you know, the definition that you all have is liking what you do each day. And sometimes I do say most days, right? Um, mm-hmm. And, and you, you mentioned that you guys are starting to call it purpose in, mm-hmm. instead of career be- well-being. And, and is there a reason why you all are using purpose instead? Yeah, so in, in our book and uh, in a lot of our talks, we've talked about, you know, everybody having a career regardless of their life situation. So it might be a stay-at-home parent. It might be someone who's re- who's technically retired from their past job. But in the end, we all kind of the first question we ask each other when we meet is, is what do you do, right? And so we think about that career as what you do. Now, the term purpose seems to resonate with that broader audience better because many people kind of who, who don't, who aren't in the traditional career that might go from, you know, age 22 or even before, depending on whether college is required for the career and all, all the way up until 65 or whatever that, that time period is, many people still kind of think of career as being that. Now, I'd argue, and I'd still still argue today that your career doesn't end. Now, you may reinvent yourself at different times in your life and change what you do, and you may even pull some of your past career into a future career if you retire. But uh, in the end, most people, are, if, if they're if they have high career well-being or a really strong sense of purpose, they've got something that they're interested in uh, continuously that, that they're pursuing, so to speak. Um, but we found that term, the term purpose, it seems to resonate with that broader group of folks who, whether it's, a, again, a stay-at-home parent or, or it's uh, someone who's out of the traditional workforce, that they've, they've got something that they're pursuing Okay. Uh, continuously. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Now, is it still correct to call it career well-being if if you are in the workforce and yeah. you want to call in, it? In fact, in fact, I would argue that <laughs> you could still call it career even if you're retired, if that's how you think about it. But uh, the term purpose seems to resonate to that broader set, broader group of people. But yeah, I mean, I think I will, I will consider myself as having a career until I'm not here anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows, Jim? You can work until your 80s, right? Like these That's people right. work until they're 95. That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and now, with Gallup, the research that you all did determined that this area, this area of well-being, was the most important dimension. Actually, more important than the other four. And tell us, talk to us a little bit about how that was determined. What did the research say? Yeah, I would. Uh... I'd probably phrase it as it's the most foundational. I would argue that what's most important is, you know, technically it's going to depend on where you're at in your life situation. So let's say it's somebody living in a in an area with a lot of crime where they're fearing for their life. I think they've probably got to get that taken care of first, right? Because they want to live, they don't want to fear for their life on a daily basis. But if those basics are taken care of, like food and shelter, then the career element is, is so foundational. I'd argue social is also pretty foundational, but if you get that career component right, that means you're spending a good chunk of your day doing something that you like to do. Unfortunately, only 20% of people can strongly agree that they like what they do each day. And so there's there, there's a lot of room for improvement there. But you think about how much time we spend uh, doing what we do. And if that's fulfilling, then it it uh, it follows into other parts of our life. We're better when we're away from work 
um, if we have a good work life. The people at the highest levels of well-being tend to have their work and life blend a bit more than others, you know, where it's just a part of who they are. And that that kind of makes a lot of sense, even uh, as things have, as the workforce has changed. And now we've got technology that's pulling us in a lot of different directions and uh, work and life are a lot more blended than they used to be. So you better you better find a way to 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 be able to use your strengths and do what you enjoy doing. But the first step is figuring out what that is, and uh, I think that's the biggest hurdle for most people. Figuring out what is what what they enjoy doing. Yeah, and you know how they can use their first know their strengths and then how they can leverage those strengths on a regular basis. Yeah, I mean when I, when I, when I was talking to a client, I was, I was kind of teeing up this conversation about these elements of well being, and I used you know, career well being or purpose. And I defined it as liking the weekdays as much as the weekend. Like, because to me, that's yay. And they laughed at me. They're like, oh, Jen, that's hilarious. <laughs> so given that real world situation and then what you just said, that 20%, only 20% agree that they like what they do. Like, what are your thoughts on the fact that so many people seem to live for the weekends and that they don't like their job? Is it because they don't know what they want to do or what makes them happy? Well, I think there's a couple of things, uh, at least if I really were going to kind of boil it down, I'd boil it down to a, a couple of things that are getting in the way. And, and one is that people aren't taking that first step to to know what their natural strengths are and then uh, get into situations where they can use their strengths more often at work. Now, granted, work does bring more unpredictable things with it, right? You've, you've got, you might have interruptions, you might have you might have crises that develop at work. There, there are going to be some unpredictable things that you might not have on a weekend. But if you're in the right job and you've got a, the other element I was going to mention is just having a great manager. But if, if you're in a job where you can utilize your strengths on a regular basis and work with other people who are doing the same, then a little bit of extra stress is offset by a lot more enjoyment where you actually enjoy the people that you're working with on a regular basis. You're getting some productive work done together. Two of the things I think that if, if you're just going to kind of look at a weekend and say, why is that so much better than a weekday? There, there are a couple of things. One is autonomy. Um, weekends, generally, we can do what we want to do. So we've got a sense of autonomy. We have a little bit more social time on weekends and weekdays on average. But we know that workplaces can be built where people have, you know, a little bit more social time where they have what we I'd call a best friend at work or somebody who they have a close relationship with at work or multiple people like that, and they have some choice. So when there's a uh, workplace is built with great managers, uh, people can still have high accountability, very clear and, and uh, significant goals, but also have a sense of autonomy in terms of how they get that work done. That can work most effectively when people are in jobs where they do what they do best. Now, doing what you do best, I think, is a continuous process. It's not something that just magically happens one day. It's learning about yourself. It's learning about your environment. People that work with the same team for a longer period of time are more likely to do what they do best because they can anticipate what the people around them are going to do and can do. So making a, a weekday like or closer to a weekend is possible if we think about those those two things, uh, you know, building a sense of, of uh, opportunities to have some autonomy at work and uh, social connections that can happen a little bit more in a highly engaged work environment than a less engaged work environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for someone like me with two small kids, sometimes I, I seem to live for the weekdays. So <laughs> <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy my work, <laughs> but uh, weekdays are just as good for me as weekends. That, that's another angle. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think that the reason people laugh at that is is mainly that twenty percent figure that you referenced. Um, it makes sense because you know, four out of five people don't like what they do each day, mm-hmm. and so they think it's you know it's it's crazy that you should that, that work should be that enjoyable, but it actually can be. And we've studied a lot of workplaces that where work is highly engaging and a really important part of of the well being of the workforce and the, and, of, and the performance of the workforce. Mm-hmm. So it, but, it isn't one or the other. Yeah. It was so interesting because when I, when I work with certain people and let's just say a, a client will, would come in and, and kind of caught about something, right? Something's not going right in, in her world in the job, but it's always interesting because I got, if I get her talking about something she enjoys within her job, whether it's a certain project or something she's looking forward to, 
it completely changes her outlook. And mm-hmm. it's, it's just like a, a, you know, a light, <laughs> a light flips. And she's like, oh, hmm, this isn't, a, you know, she likes aspects of it. And if you can get her talking about those things, then she just lights up. But mm-hmm. you have to take her there. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's not going to naturally go there. Well, and I think that's what, that's one of the things that great managing does is it helps people get there. You know, great manage, great managers will create strategies like that to help people get to that mindset where they're thinking, coming into work, not thinking that they're a victim of work, but they're actually a, an important component in driving the future of the organization, that they're, they're, they're an important player in the future. Mm-hmm. And, and they help kind of create that future. Right. Yes, we're going to talk to definitely talk about poor managers uh, at some point in this because they they do um, wreak havoc in an organization, especially when it comes to this this aspect of well being. Mm-hmm. Now, what is the link between a those eighty percent of people who have a poor or a struggling career purpose dimension of well being and their physical health? Yeah. So uh, one interesting finding is that young workers. So, so we we know in general that age relates to health outcomes, right? So, the older we get, the more susceptible we are to to disease, unfortunately. But we, one of the findings from our research was that uh, young workers who are actively disengaged, so who have who have a miserable workplace, report more unhealthy days than older engaged workers. So that shows you how how much impact having an engaging workplace can have. So young workers actually do worse than older older workers if they have a bad work environment. And on contrary, on the other side of that, the old, older workers who are engaged do much better from a health perspective. And then the the other thing is that if you look at some outcomes like, for instance, depression, um, when we've tracked that over time in longitudinal studies, workers who are actively disengaged have two times the rate of new incident of depression in the future than those who are engaged. And so there's there's that health outcome as well. Of course, depression is the result of a lot of compounding things, but workplace is certainly one element. The other thing that we've looked at, we've kind of gotten it down to the, into this in kind of micro details where we're looking at uh, the momentary physiology of engaged workers and comparing that to disengaged workers and even uh, measuring the stress hormone cortisol through saliva samples in the moment. And we find that engaged workers have lower levels of the stress hormone cortisol in the mornings as they're anticipating work in comparison to disengaged workers who have higher levels of cortisol in the mornings. And on week on weekends, when they're not working, there's no difference. But on the weekdays, we see big differences in uh, the stress hormone cortisol. So at a lot of different levels, there are connections between career well-being and physical health. And th- there's a pretty significant academic literature um, built up on this topic as well. And it's all showing that, you know, work is a really important component. Getting work right is a really important component to our overall health. Not only the direct health consequences, but also the indirect through choices we make. Mm-hmm. We, yeah. It, and, and you mentioned some factors that impact this, this area, so per, uh, career, purpose, well-being. Um, you talked about using your strengths, but um, that doesn't happen often in organizations. So when we think about the organization as a whole, what are some factors that can, I guess, impact it positively or negatively? Yeah, we found four general factors that are all actionable that you know organizations can do something about to impact improve career well-being one is is to make sure that people have interesting and meaningful activities so that that starts with getting to know the individual and and then uh, the second is is getting them in situations where they can use their strengths so uh, providing interesting meaningful activities the ability to first know your strengths and then use your strengths to to engage in those activities that are also of course they have to be aligned with what the organization is trying to get done too but and that relates to the third one which is achieving goals People with high career well-being see themselves making progress and achieving goals that are significant. And so having your work aligned with something significant, clear expectations that are aligned with something significant the organization's trying to get done. And then the fourth is having a leader who motivates you. So we were talking about that earlier, you know, having a leader who kind of 
brings the best out of you on a continuous basis is really important. We did a, um, we call it a day reconstruction study where we um, asked people to relive their previous work day and asked them a number of questions about what they were doing during the day, uh, how much time they spent doing, doing various activities. And before we had conducted the study, we had measured the, their levels of engagement similar to the momentary study we did earlier, although this was kind of a retrospective day reconstruction. People are pretty effective at reconstructing the previous day. If you stretch it out further, it's a lot more difficult. But what we found, though, is that people who are engaged at work spent four times the amount of time using their strengths to do what they do best as, as working on a weakness, for instance, or, or doing an activity where they're focused on fixing a weakness. Um, it didn't mean they they weren't doing that. We all have jobs where we have to do things we don't want to do, but they spent four times as much using their strengths to do what they do best. And they also reported being so absorbed in their work that time passed quickly. So that's the flow from Csikszentmihalyi, um, who studied flow for his pretty much entire career. But ab- so absor- absorption was a big part of it. The other thing was really interesting, too, is that if you look at the other end of the continuum, that the people who are disengaged at work, they had about an equal split one-to-one between uh, doing what they do best, using their strengths versus doing what they don't do so well. So it isn't, I guess the point from that research is that the takeaway is that it's not a balancing act of just trying to use your strengths half the time and work on weaknesses half the time. Given how we respond to different stimuli, it's important that we spend a lot more time and that managers spend a lot of time thinking about what people do best it doesn't mean they're not going to fix some things and have corrective suggestions. Uh, sometimes the feedback will have to be tough. But if the primary focus is, you know, what does each person do best? How do we leverage what they do best? How do we build, going through that list again, interesting, meaningful activities? How do we help this person use their strengths more often? How do we help them achieve goals based on who they are? And how do we, you know, motivate them individually by giving them recognition that's most appropriate for them individually? Then, uh, I guess those would be some of the takeaways from that research. Yeah, and I'm glad you, you you touched on that with strengths because I think a lot of people think that when you focus on strengths, you don't you don't help your weaknesses, or rather, you look over yeah. the things that you can improve on. So, can you just spend a minute talking about that? Because uh, my husband's always like, "Well, you need to still fix your weaknesses." <laughs> yeah, and talking about the difference between still improving, but but maybe not going spending too much time on the weaknesses. Well, I think your husband's right. We do, we do have to, um, we can't forget that we all have things we need to shore up. But if we spend, so if, if we, as managers, if we fixate on weaknesses, that's when it gets, it's really draining because that's all that you're hearing, right? You're never good enough because you're always having to fix something. But if you, if you focus on fixing something at the same time, you're leveraging your strengths. Now, some people have strengths that make them want to fix things, right? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, that works really well from that perspective. But if we spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to achieve in the future and how we're going to achieve it and and how we're going to use what we do best to do that, it's a lot more rewarding and fulfilling than continually being corrected. And so kind of a big shift for from uh, you know a manager moving from being a boss to being a coach is to shift that mentality from fixating and becoming an expert on somebody's weaknesses to becoming an expert on their strengths. And still knowing that, by by the way, that the corrective kind of suggestions, Mm -hmm. they come across a lot, (laughs) a a lot better. And uh, if if there's an environment and trust built, and it's very difficult to build trust unless you know the person for who they are to begin with, as opposed to, this is the person that knows me for my weaknesses. Um, right. It's going to kind of go in one ear and out the other a lot of times because you don't really know this person's in it for your best interest. Mm-hmm. And some of that is our own, you know, I've, I've battled with that when I was a leader in my prior organization that I'm just one of those people who likes to always improve things. And so I had to really, it took a hard lesson learned once I, I remember looking like at a, some, a review that I did. And it was, you know, it was my mid-year review for somebody. And then at the year end, I was like, oh my God, like, this is terrible. I was completely like picking on every little minute thing. And there weren't a lot of like positives and here's all the things you did well. So I actually had to see it in black and white because I think some people like myself are just 
we, we, we are critical. <laughs> we like to go first for the weaknesses and not take the, take the minute to build up the strengths, not the minute, the many, many minutes it takes to, to build up strengths in people. Yeah. And it's, uh, unfortunately it's easier for us. What's well, probably fortunate in that, it, you know, that kind of a mindset of fixing things and, and noticing weaknesses probably kept our species alive for a long time. So <laughs> that side of it's good, but in terms of developing people, it is a natural mindset that we have to kind of uh, intentionally fix, I guess, for lack of a better word. It's a, uh, it's a mindset that we have to be conscious about that. Uh, you know, I'm a researcher. And so, we, you know, researchers look at data and we're, we're always correcting things too. So it does take a, an intentional approach to think first about what people do well and to almost over-exaggerate that a bit to get to that, uh, at least to the four to one mm -hmm. ratio. So what if you are, what if you find yourself in a role that does not play to your strengths? Like you can do it, it's fine, but it's not really, again, playing to your strengths. What do you do? I think, you know, when, when people work with the same team for quite a while, they can start to figure out and learn other people's ability to know the strengths of the people around you. But if you are in a role, let's say you're, you're asked to do an activity continually that doesn't fit you that drains you i think your your best bet is to is to find uh to, to carefully find another role that fits your strengths so that what you're doing every day gives you energy i mean again we all have jobs where there are going to be some things that are more draining than others but if we can spend most of our time doing the things that give us energy and continually refine that. And sometimes that means um, having discussions with your manager about that. In, in other cases, it involves, again, getting to know the strengths of your teammates so that you know where you fit in most appropriately. You know, for, for example, I, I have high focus. And so if I have days where I'm bouncing from one thing to the next, I feel a lot more drained at the end of the day, um, even though I have to have some of those days. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I try to I try to build more days where I I have time to get absorbed in, in some in some work. And then at the end of those days I feel a ton of energy. I don't even feel like I worked hardly. And so uh Yeah. Well I'm guessing one sign you just mentioned is are you noticing that there's certain days you're drained more than others? Are there yeah. certain days that you're you're going home and you're full of energy and you're like looking back and going, Well, I had a whole day to focus on this one research project. Cause I find that some people don't even know that. They just you know, kind of feel some kind of way and they don't, they can't track it back to what they did that day. Well, those weekday weekend differences are kind of a sign of that. So if you just mm -hmm. look, look at the population week, the, the moods of people on weekends and holidays <laughs> is a lot higher than on weekdays. And so there are a lot of people going through that cycle. It's kind of like Groundhog's Day. They keep kind of reliving the same days and they haven't really taken the time to, to write down or record actually what happened. And how, the, you know, and even to record the days when they have a lot of fulfillment and, and a, a lot of energy at the end of the day, because there can be some of those for most jobs. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to replace, you know, not having a great manager. But there's a lot of things we can do individually as well, to get to well, know ourselves, our teammates, our managers. Right. Well, let's dig into the, the leadership, <laughs> because that, that is a huge problem within organizations is, is not the best leadership, might I say, poor leadership. And you mentioned as one of your four ways or one of one of the four factors that impacts career well-being is your, do you have a leader that brings out the best of you or in you? I'd have to say, if I look back at my career, there, I didn't have a ton of those. So what do organizations really need to do around this leadership pain point? I think there are, uh, I'm going to, probably oversimplify this again, but I think there are two really important uh, components to that. One is is having a system for how you select uh, managers into the managerial role uh, to begin with. And so there are scientific systematic ways of doing that. that that's not something that you can fix overnight because nobody's going to change in and out all their managers overnight. One of the reasons that we're in this issue right now is that most people get into the role of manager based on success in a previous non-managerial role. So they might've been a really good salesperson, really good 
accountant, a really good engineer, really good researcher, whatever it might be. And so the assumption is the right to passage is then to become a manager. And in many cases, the you know the reward systems are set are set up to reward getting into the managerial role. And the second is just length of service. So being successful in non-managerial role and length of service, both those are they seem like equitable, you know, equitable kinds of things to do, but Unfortunately, it doesn't take into account people's natural ability to manage others. And so who we pick, and again, this can be designed and selected for before people get into the role, where there there are some people just better at motivating others. There's some people that look forward to the idiosyncrasies of different people that they're managing, whereas some other people will dread that, you know, the the messiness of people, you might say. (laughs) The, uh, (laughs) there are, um, there's some people just really good at influencing others and, 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 and working to get past obstacles, to get a team past obstacles in a way that makes them feel good about it. There are people who are naturally good at seeing a crisis and communicate in a way that gets people excited about, because na- nowadays, I mean, organizations are changing a lot. So you, we've got to have managers that can get people moving in the same direction when changes occur. So that that's, that's probably half of it is, is just figuring out who should be a manager to begin with. That's probably the more difficult half. The other half of it is just how we develop individuals into better managers over time. So moving from being a traditional boss to a coach, to somebody who's who an employee might look at and say, this person um, knows me, this person is out for my best interest, and this person has some clear clear goals that I'm I'm a part of you know, developing. You know, one of the things that we've seen is kind of low-hanging fruit is that uh, most managers don't have a default where they are involving the employee in setting the goals. So if managers just more often involved employees in setting their own goals, that'd be a big step forward. But the other is they, you know, managers can learn how to can learn about individual differences. They can learn about their own individual differences, their own strengths. They can learn about the strengths of, of their teammates. And that's kind of a shortcut actually to getting to know people to build a sense of interpersonal congruence where mm-hmm. there's a higher level of trust. And so managers, uh, regardless of what level they're at, they, they can, they can learn how to set clear expectations. They can learn how to coach, do a better job of coaching and they can do a better job of, you know, learn how to do a better job of, of holding people accountable in a way that makes them you know, feel good and that they've accomplished something. And um, most people come to work wanting those things. So it isn't like they're trying to get someone to do something they don't already want to do. Right. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're, uh, so it's a matter of kind of helping them understand human nature a little bit. Um, I think, as you said earlier, Jen, um, it's easy for us to kind of our natural mindset for many of us is to think about what's wrong and try to fix it. But it's a matter of building coaching habits where managers are more likely to lead with strength as opposed to lead with weakness. Mm -hmm. Now I was, when I was doing some research on the management, so you just talked about the, the, the tendency of organizations to, you know, promote individual really good high producing technical contributors or seniority. But I think I remember when I was researching this, there's only, please correct me if I'm wrong, 10% 10% of people who have a natural leadership ability or some really low number? Yeah, it's about, it's about one in 10 that have, I'd call it a really high level of, of you know, manager, we call it manager innate tendencies or talents mm-hmm. um, that the manager may have pre. Then there's another two in 10 that have a have a pretty high level, not that extremely high level. Then the the, the rest of the 70, I, I'm, I would never claim you can't, there's a lot of things you can do to coach them to be better managers. So I wouldn't say that they're, you know, in a situation where they're, you know, they can't improve, they can still improve. And that's why I said about half of it is who you pick and the other half is how you develop the people you already have. So, I mean, we've all seen this in our careers. If you had multiple managers, you know, that, that a, a small subset of those managers you've had, unless you're really lucky, uh, a small subset of the managers you've had um, just kind of have a natural knack for working with people. They're, they're really good at naturally making people feel good about themselves and, and getting people to accomplish significant things at work in a way that fits with what the individual is trying to get done too. So, but 
so so there there are those, and we want to select more like them. I think every organization needs to figure out ways to select more like those people who have that natural ability. But we've also learned that we can teach managers to get a lot better, regardless mm-hmm. of what level they're at. Yeah, assuming they 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 have to want to get better. Correct. Yeah. I'm yeah. guessing there's, there's some hardened seasoned professionals who are just like, <laughs> get it. I'm going to ride it till I retire. There are some of those out there. Yes. Um, but, you know, I think part of it is just, you have to, I think starting with helping them get to know themselves first, I think for somebody who kind of leads with a weakness mindset, they probably haven't given too much thought to how they have developed themselves and how they, you know, how they respond to different things themselves. So I think it starts there, but then, but you're, yeah, that's right. I mean, there are some people that we are not going to be able to do much, much about, but. But I'm assuming that's the minority of people. Like the most people I would say do not go to work and say, I want to be a bad manager today. They, right. They're just busy and get lost in, in uh, the work life and all the expectations put on them. And when you said there is some low hanging fruit, just involving employees and setting goals, but even you know, at a very basic level, expectations being set, which I find is something that is such a flawless basic that doesn't happen in a lot yeah. of employee-manager relationships. Yeah, about half of people don't clearly know what's expected of them when they come to work. And so there's a there's a lot of room right there on that one. Um, but yeah, yeah, the... the um, there's going to be that kind of kind of subset of, and I would also argue that there's an organizational responsibility. If you've got evidence that you've got managers who are disengaging employees on a continuous basis, I think there's a responsibility to your organization and to the individuals they're managing because they're not not, not only, they're, I mean, they're probably miserable themselves, but they're they're also making everybody else around them more miserable, and that's not good for the organization for all the right. reasons we mentioned. Right, right. Yes, they're multiplying the effect. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's happen. So when we think about, so before I move on to the next question, is there anything else that individuals can do to increase their well-being in this area or organizations? I think you've hit quite a few points, but is there anything that, I'm, that I missed or you want to have some space to talk about? Well, I think uh, it kind of starts with what you want to get done with work, what your purpose is at work. In your in your career, what you're trying to get done in your career from a broad perspective, where do you see yourself in the future? And then how how can you get to know your strengths well enough that you can leverage what you do best and who you how how you what you do best and how you can develop and grow to achieve those larger larger ideals? So attach yourself to um, a purpose that aligns with the organization that you're in. I think goal setting is a big component to it. But it's it's hard to replace just getting to know yourself and your strengths and building on those throughout your life. And I think sometimes too, people have a tendency if they're in a job they may not like, if they're one of those eighty percent who just don't have a high career well being or purpose well being, um, and they think, well, I'll just go out on my own because that's obviously the <laughs> that's the obvious solution. I'm just here to say that even when you work for yourself, there are things that you have to do that you don't necessarily like doing. So let me just say that here in case uh, that is, that's people's uh, response to say, well, let's go work for myself. Because there's always things you don't, you can't like everything. There's not everything um, in your day-to-day life that, that you're going to absolutely love. Yeah, I, th- I think that uh, the right way to do career or purpose well-being is to continue to refine it over time. So as you get to know yourself and what you do best and what your role is that you in the in an ideal setting, you're able to adjust your job over time as the organization you're in grows. So that I think that should be the goal and knowing that like you said, you're always going to have things that you don't look forward to doing, but that shouldn't be what dominates your workday, right? right. So that's 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 the key is it Heck, I've, you know, my my job has evolved considerably over the years, and there's still things that I don't look forward to doing, like timesheets and that sort of thing. <laughs> just part of the deal. No one likes no no like a timesheet. <laughs> well, I'm sure the there's deal. someone out there that does love a timesheet. Maybe, maybe there, maybe there are those. <laughs> <laughs> They're there, Jim. I promise. Somewhere out there. <laughs> so when we think about wellness professionals. Um, I mean, obviously, they know, at least they know now, that career well-being impacts total well-being. 
And, but they don't often see this as their responsibility or their purview. And sometimes the organization doesn't, right? They're going, hey, you're the wellness person. Step off. You can't do any of this other stuff. But we know about the impact. So what's a tangible way that a wellness professional can positively impact this area of well-being? Uh, I would start with giving some thought to how change occurs in organizations. And when change happens, I've seen it happen in pockets and then spread. And so I think working with managers and their teams, I've seen this very effectively where you see kind of a pocket of people that are kind of working on their physical well-being together, but it's driven by the social component, right? Or it might be driven by a community component. So I think uh, taking that holistic, first taking a holistic approach where you're thinking about not just working. So most, when I look at wellness programs, a lot of them are so focused on the physical component, the health component, really important. But to make that work right, it's got to be thought of more holistically, I think, where you're thinking about how work blends with getting the health goals done, how it could, it could align with community endeavors, community well-being endeavors, um, how it very likely, change very likely happens in a social setting where people are supporting one another and where you've got people setting goals together, setting expectations, um, even from a, from a health perspective, whether it's you know weight loss or diet or BMI or body fat or whatever it is that, you know, that, that they're tracking, that there are pe- people changing together in a kind of a social con- context. So I would just, I would, I would encourage wellness uh, professionals to think about that holistic part and to, to work with managers and people that are already in existing social pockets. Mm-hmm. Cause I think then you start to see some growth and you start to see it spread and uh, change seems to happen in the context of a social expectation. And there's a lot of things that go into that. You got to have the right defaults so that it's easy for people to do it's in their best interest. But the culture is really a social expectation and that tends to happen most easily in pockets of employees that already work together. Yeah. Or I mean, that are or they're aligned in some way, right? They're mm-hmm. people that are maybe they have similar interests. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that because oftentimes we we often just form our own thing and we pull people from all of these different social <laughs> constructs. We pull them all together and that same dynamic isn't happening. So if we could go to where the changes already exist or go to the intact teams and, and work directly with them. I think that could get yield us some better results. Yeah, we've been talking about the manager a lot, but I think a lot of it does stem from the nudges from the manager. Mm-hmm. And a lot of places it might seem kind of sensitive that it's not the manager's business to be thinking about people's health. But I think if they have a trusting relationship where they're already building an engaged work team, then the door is going to be open mm-hmm. and they don't have to force it. And I don't think forcing it would probably work anyway, but it starts with they're being trust that this, this person's in it for my best interest. And then, you know, inviting people to join some, you know, a wellness activity seems a lot more natural. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like, doesn't seem like a weird idea. If so, it, it does kind of start with the manager building trust and having some levels of engagement. And that starts with basic, you know, the basic responsibilities of clear expectations, um, getting people what they need to do their work, building, solid relationships with people where you're listening to them and getting their ideas and leveraging their strengths. And then the, I think the, the well-being or wellness elements happen a lot in a lot more fluid kind of way. We found that uh, people that were engaged were more than 20% more likely to get involved in a wellness program that was offered to them mm-hmm. than those that aren't. And about 70% of engagements driven by the manager. So as managers, man, it, all, it all comes back to the manager, which is your new book that's coming out in May. Do you want to give us a quick overview of what it's going to be about? Yeah, so uh, the, the book we've been working on recently, and it's all written now, is has been about really changing culture, if you're going to kind of put it in a nutshell. You, it's very difficult to change a culture without great managers. As I mentioned, they, they explain about 70% of 
team engagement. So what we did is we reviewed all of our research from the past decade, even stretched back a little further than that, and uh, compiled our 52 biggest discoveries about how culture changes in organizations. And the discoveries are grouped into five sections, uh, strategy, and then uh, culture, employment brand, which, you know, we've learned about employment brand that it, uh, it spreads pretty quickly now based on your authentic culture, mainly due to social media and just how, much, how quickly news travels nowadays. So employment brand, a section on boss to coach. So these are our best discoveries about how, how you move from becoming a boss to being a coach. And then we have a, a section on the future of work with a lot of these uh, t- topics that are that have been forefront in people's minds lately, like workspace, remote working, DNI, a few chapters on on women in the workplace and setting uh, the workplace up upright, and artificial intelligence to uh, predictive analytics. So we, we try to cover a broad range of topics. Of course, 52 chapters sounds like a lot. They're really short chapters. <laughs> just and, a chapter a week. It's just not. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> just think about it as a, a menu of, we don't expect people to pick it up and read it cover to cover on a plane ride. It's more a reference book with 52 discoveries grouped into those five areas that uh, hopefully will address issues that people are dealing with out there in the workplace. Okay. And, and what's the title? It's the manager. It's the manager and it's due out in May, correct? At least in May? That's correct. That's All right. Correct. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. And um, Jim, thank you so much for your time and your your expertise in this, this matter, this area. Thank you, Jen. Really appreciate it. One of the things I frequently hear from wellness professionals is that they want a tribe. They want to find their people. In other words, a place where they can express their opinion without getting chastised for it and where they can get support when they're butting up against the old wellness paradigm. If you're looking for that safe space, come and join us in the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. To find us, you can just go to Facebook and in the search bar, type Redesigning Wellness Community and it'll pop right up. You'll just have to answer a couple questions and I'll let you right in. I'd love to see you there.